Uh, let me share uh, a story about tent before uh, we start on the story from Azerbaijan. I told you this is uh, <laughs> this is uh, tent's logo. It was made when we started tent ten years ago, and it's a flame because uh, tent in Norwegian means being on fire, and then it's a tent, so it's a play of words. And uh, why did we start tent? Uh, why did we go into tent making and tent making, recruiting tent makers? Uh, what happened was that if, when I met my wife in 1993, we talked together and uh, we both had a kind of a calling for tent making and we were interested in that kind of work. And I'm a journalist by profession and she's a business administrator. So when we thought that God was calling us to go to Azerbaijan, we thought that we can go as tent makers and we can support ourselves. I can write articles for Western newspapers and she can work as a business administrator. So we suggested to the mission board in the, in the mission agency we were connected with that why don't you make Azerbaijan to tent making mission field? You can try out a new way of working and uh, we can support ourselves. Unfortunately, we suggested it a bit too late in the process, so they did not agree on Azerbaijan becoming a tent making field like that. And uh, they also wanted to send us more as traditional missionaries being paid by the, by the agency. After two years in Azerbaijan, uh, I mean in Azerbaijan, as you will see, we had all the benefits of that, that a tent maker will have because we started a humanitarian agency there. And we were not re recognized as uh, religious professional workers. We were recognized as uh, development workers. And, no one expected us to take any responsibility in the church. Uh, but after two years in Azerbaijan, uh, these ideas came back, and not only that we should be tent makers, but that we should start a uh, uh, resource center for tent making in Norway. And we started talking about it, we wrote down the plan, and uh, we also presented the plan to a few leaders in the mission agency, saying that we, we think that there should be a resource for tent making in Norway and this is the idea we've got and could this be, could this be started within like this agency and again they, they did not approve of the idea so the, the whole plan ended up in the drawer in, uh, in, uh, on my desk uh, in my desk so and there it stayed and then one year later again we felt like through, through other people God said that now it's time to go into something new. And we thought maybe God is kind of want us to take out this plan again and actually enforce it and make it happen. So we started praying about that. And when you feel that God is asking you to start a new agency, we felt that and that's, that's a big idea. And we need to know for sure that actually this is his plan for us. So uh, we prayed and we prayed and we said, oh, God, you need to confirm, confirm this, that this is actually your plan and not our thoughts. And we don't want, we don't want to kind of become famous for starting an agency. We, we want to follow your plan. So we prayed and uh, there was no answer. We prayed again, no answer. And uh, in the end, we were so tired of praying that we just said, well, you know, we have to ask for a sign. So we prayed and we said, God, if you send a person to us saying that you should start a new mission agency, then we will do it. If you don't send a person like that, we will not do it. <laughs> and we knew, I mean, we had informed like two or three people in, uh, in uh, like the leaders in the organization we worked for. And then Birgit and I, we had talk, talked about this just between the two of us. So there were like five people in the world knowing about this idea. So God could basically, basically send anyone. Then on uh, um, February 29, 2000, uh, we woke up early in the morning and uh, Birgit, my wife, she said, you know, I have such a strange feeling inside today. It's like something good is going to happen and uh, maybe we'll have some guests coming over. I'm sure this will be a very good day. And then I went to my work in a microfinance institution and uh, she had her quiet time. She was reading from the Bible, from the Psalms. And she said it was like a few words stood up. It, it's like, answer us the day we, we shout to you. And uh, she thought, well, today we will receive the answer on our prayer. Mm -hmm. I came back from work and uh, 
this is how my family looked, what it looked like when we, we were down there. Eric, he was five years old, Trigger was three, and this is Sigrid, she was one year old at that time. And I came back from work and we sat down around the table to, to, uh, to eat dinner. And as we're sitting down, Eric, who was five years at that time, he says, How do you start a mission agency? No. <laughs> and I looked at him and I said, Why do you ask about that, Eric? And then he says, I think you should start a mission agency. <laughs> five year old. <laughs> <laughs> I looked at my wife and then I looked back at Eric and I said to him, Eric, you know, I think God just spoke through you. And he immediately, he turned to Trigva, who was three years old at that time, and he said, Trigva, has God ever spoken through you? <laughs> <laughs> so that was kind of God answering our prayer there and then through our own son. And, uh, you know, when things like this happen, then this was immediately attacked by God's enemy. And mm -hmm. uh, we, 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 I told my wife, I said to my wife, shouldn't it be an adult coming saying to us, <laughs> <laughs> can we believe this? It's true, our old child. <laughs> and, uh, but then in the end, we, we had to realize that, well, actually, we, we asked for a sign, and God gave the sign to us, so we have to do it. Otherwise, we're unfaithful. Of course, this whole incident, it, it, it impacted Eric tremendously. So, uh, after uh, a few days later, I was driving him back from nursery in, in Orlada, and uh, he was sitting in the back of the car. And then he says, uh, Daddy, am I a prophet? <laughs> That's a good question, isn't it? <laughs> am I a prophet? <laughs> So that was the starting point. Then we came uh, back to Norway on a vacation. Uh, and as you know, Norwegians, we have a lot of vacations. So we came back on a vacation in May. Uh, and we planned to kind of start, that was our plan, to, to kind of connect with the tent making people in Norway who were already there. And then just start tent and go back to uh, Azerbaijan as tent makers. That was our plan. Uh, so we connected with uh, Berit, who is a friend of Ari, and uh, she's been the tent maker promoter in Norway for many, many years, a sole voice of, for tent making, and uh, she's a very, very busy woman. We called to her, uh, and uh, it was my wife calling to her, saying that, well, you know, we feel God is, that God is call, uh, calling us to start a uh, resource center for tent making in Norway. And uh, what do you think about that? And then everything went quiet in the other end of the phone line there. It's like my wife said, well, I, maybe <laughs> this was not a good idea. But then Barry said, you know, uh, it's quiet here because I'm crying. And uh, then she told that the day before she'd been to a meeting and she had been preaching and uh, she got very negative feedback from a woman. So on the way back, she had told God, she just said, I don't, I'm, I'm not going to do this anymore. <laughs> I'm quitting <laughs> this ministry. And, uh, and then now uh, we came there the day after and uh, saying that we, we actually have to kind of work with you or take over what you're doing. And uh, there had been many, many uh, other people also mm -hmm. kind of giving her words from God that now is the time for you to hand this work off to someone else. And then we came into the picture. Mm -hmm. So we're actually writing down that story in a book that will be published uh, later on, <laughs> sometime. <Yeah. laughs> yes, uh, so that's the story behind Tent. And uh, when God called us to go to Azerbaijan, it was also in a very concrete way. And uh, we talked about calling. Maybe Dave, Dave, did he say something about calling in the first sessions here? Uh, I mean, I think, I, I strongly believe that God can call uh, people to specific tasks, as we can read in the Bible. And then we have the general calling, which is for, for everyone. And uh, from time to time, you see uh, believers stop doing things, or they do not go into the tasks that are already there, because they're sitting down, sitting still, waiting for a specific call. 
and that's not good. I mean, we're all called to bring the gospel onwards to new people groups and to the ends of the earth. That's a calling for everyone. And then God is also, he can also ask us to do something specific. We should not stop kind of doing his mission, mm -hmm. just waiting for a specific calling. I think that's not right. So, uh, but we have experienced a very specific call to go to Azerbaijan and a specific call to, to start tent. And uh, that was necessary for us. Uh, you know, when you start something new, it's, it's, it's hard work. And uh, in Azerbaijan as well, we, we were pioneer missionaries there. And uh, it's very hard work. And if, you, if you're not sure that this is from God, you may quit very easily. Whereas in tent, we have, my wife and I, we have this agreement that since God calls us into this ministry, we will continue to do it until he calls us to something else. So it's not an option to quit. <laughs> and that, that's, that's good, actually, yes. because it's so tempting many times, I can tell you that. Although, I mean, both Ari and I, we don't like to travel that much. It's like uh, <laughs> to stay away from the family is not a great joy. And, uh, and then you have, it's, it's a lot of work, and uh, many times you don't see that many results and you think well it could be easy to just for me to use my profession work as a journalist make money and <laughs> have a good life but then i've told my wife many times this, this is tempting but then we say well it's not possible to do it without having this strong feeling that we are unfaithful and that means we cannot do it so uh, that's why we're staying on <laughs> and uh, in the good i mean we have many many Good things happening as well, and then it's a joy, of course. And it's, most of the days, it's a joy. Yes, it's it is. Yeah. But then we have, the, of course, as in any job, also the tough periods where you feel like it would be actually a good idea to do something else. <laughs> okay, here is uh, Baku, the capital of Azerbaijan, and it's written. It's spelled two ways. It's spelled Baki and Baku with the U in the end. And one person, he asked me, well, do you, do you actually pronounce it Baku or Baki? And the thing is, it's pronounced Baku, which is in between. <laughs> <laughs> That's why it's hard to say how you should also spell it. So this is uh, Baku, the capital of uh, Azerbaijan. And uh, this was a very, very rich city 100 years ago. If you go back to like uh, the beginning of the 20th century, uh, Azerbaijan produced half of the oil being sold on the world markets. So they had a huge income. And uh, they spent much of this money also building very beautiful buildings in uh, the capital there. This is the country I come from, uh, Norway. So Norway is not the capital of Sweden. <laughs> and I live here in this city here called Bergen, which is, I told you already it's the most beautiful city uh, in Northern Europe. So uh, I thought it was all of Europe. Well, yeah, all of Europe. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you're right. Yeah. And that, that's not according to me, it's according to American tourists coming to Norway <laughs> and to Europe. So, uh, so yeah, it's not my opinion. And then we lived in this country here, which is called Azerbaijan. You see the Caspian Sea, it's north of Iran, south of Russia, and then you have Armenia. And probably you've heard about this area here as well. It's called Nagorno-Karabakh. Have you heard about that? There was a war going on here in, uh, in the 90s, early 90s, with Armenia actually occupying, and they're still occupying this land here, 20% mm -hmm. of Armenia, uh, of Azerbaijan is soil. So this, this area here is occupied. And uh, Armenia is a Christian nation, receiving a lot of support from the U.S. Uh, Azerbaijan uh, is a Muslim nation, receiving no support from, from the U.S. But uh, actually this uh, occupation was uh, condemned by the whole U.N. Uh, Security Council, and they asked uh, Armenia to withdraw their soldiers, but they still haven't done that. We lived in Ganja, which is the second biggest city in Azerbaijan. And uh, you know Ganja, if you search for Ganja in, on, on the web, what comes up then? Yeah. Mariana. Mariana, yeah. yeah. So Ari, in, in, his, <laughs> in his fun times, he, 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 call, <laughs> he liked to call me Stoner from Ganja. <laughs> Stoner from Ganja. 
360 kilometers to go from back here to Ganja. Ganja has 200,000 200, inhabitants. What's that little spot? That, that's totally separated. How does yeah. that work? Yeah, <coughs> that's also awesome. John is called like Hichiban. So, how do they travel between? Just no, you travel by airplane. <coughs> really? Yeah. Interesting. Wow. Yeah. And uh, these borders here are actually it's a result of uh, the policy of Stalin. He moved people around. And uh, the conflict here is because uh, Stalin also moved many Armenians into Azerbaijan, so the majority of the population here were actually Armenians. And then they started complaining that they were not treated very well by the Azerbaijanis. And that's why the Armenians decided that we need to occupy this area here because it's the majority would be Armenians anyway. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's not an easy situation, you know. Uh, unfortunately, Azerbaijan is situated in a place where it has been many, many wars throughout history. And you have the Persian Empire here, and then the Tsar Russian Empire here, and the wars were very often fought on <laughs> Azerbaijani soil. So it's kind of an unfortunate situation. You're caught in between two superpowers. And then you also had the Mongolian Empire also coming this way, and you had the German Empire also taking this whole land here. So it has been a lot of wars throughout history. As I told you, in Azerbaijan they drive two, two kinds of cars. And uh, I hope the video will work this time because it's about the future. And my wife and I are going back to Azerbaijan a few years from now, as you will see. Here we go. Uh, has any one of you owned a Lada at any time? No, no. The Trabant. Ah, oh, Trabant, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, almost the same, not quite. Yeah, yeah. I would not recommend anyone to no. <laughs> buy a Lada. We bought a brand new Lada and uh, we had to bring it for repairs every second week. And uh, yeah, so there are many Lada jokes. Have you heard any Lada jokes? <laughs> how, how do you double the, the, the price of a Lada? You know that? Fill it with Yeah, fill it with gas. That's an easy one. <laughs> so, what, what do you call it when you see a Lada on top of a hill? It's a miracle. <laughs> and uh, why do the ladders have uh, heated back windows? No, it's because when you push the car, you, you're... Oh, it's going to to work. It's going to get warm. Okay, there are many, many ladder jokes. Some facts about Azerbaijan. It's a former Soviet Republic. It got its independence in 1991. It has huge oil reserves in the Caspian Sea. And uh, there are uh, many foreign companies helping Azerbaijan to produce that oil. It has enormous corruption. And uh, we lived there for four years. And uh, there is a company called, uh, uh, or uh, an organization called Transparency International, monitoring uh, corruption in the different nations. And Azerbaijan was always among the top three nations when we lived there. It has, the situation became a bit better when we moved back to Norway, I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> so then they are like top 10 uh, when it comes to the worst nation, nations. And uh, we've seen like uh, first hand, got first hand uh, information on how uh, corruption can destroy a nation. It's really, it's very, very sad. I mean, even at the first, the first uh, graded school, to be able to allow to continue uh, the school, the parents would have to pay the teacher. So that was one thing. To get the exam, like uh, at university level, my like the boy in the neighboring house, he came back home from his exam, and I asked him, "Well, how was the exam?" And he said, "Well, it was good. I only had to pay fifty dollars." And I said, well, was that all they asked you about, like $50 and uh, no other questions about the subject? And they said, no, it was only one question. It was, they wanted $50. <laughs> uh, and that's the exam. And then you get the paper that you can actually do something. I mean, would you like to be operated by a medical doctor who's got his exam papers by mm -hmm. 
pain bribes like that? Not at all. And we saw people dying when they were operated because the doctors obviously didn't know what they were doing. Uh, then, then, then you had the police. To, to get a job with the police, like the street police, uh, traffic police, uh, the cost of a uh, job there was 5,000 US dollars you had to pay to like a superior. And then you got the uniform and how did you get the money back? Well, you had to stop the cars and asking the drivers to pay. <laughs> pay. Like you didn't do any mistake in the traffic, you were just stopped by the police and then you had to pay to continue. So that was part of the corruption. And my wife and I, we decided, well, we can, we can just use the system. So when we come back from Azerbaijan, we will be the best and most educated uh, couple in the Norwegian history. We will have PhDs, both of us, <laughs> <laughs> two subjects. <laughs> but it never happened. You know. <laughs> Enormous corruption. Eight million people living in uh, Azerbaijan, 99% are Muslims. And the majority of the Azerbaijani people group, because the people group is much bigger than eight million, it's actually around 25 million people. And the majority, they live in uh, northern Iran. So uh, yeah, this is all Azerbaijani kind of, uh, as the majority, uh, majority Azerbaijani area. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is also causing some political tensions there between Azerbaijan and Iran. Our idea, uh, uh, it has not still been uh, fulfilled this plan, but uh, the, we have a plan to train Azerbaijani tent makers to bring uh, the gospel to northern Iran because it's the same people group. And also for me as a Westerner, uh, as it is for any Westerner, you can get a one year visa for Iran if you're lucky. Whereas the Azerbaijanis, they can get a 10 year multiple entry visa to do business here across the border. And you know, also, uh, Westerner will cause a kind of uh, attraction, and uh, is very, uh, Westerner is very very visible, whereas in Azerbaijani it looks like the other people there. So I think that's still a very good idea and I hope it will happen sometime that we can train the Azerbaijanis to bring the gospel there to northern Iran. It's, it is taking place in some sense already, but I think we should be even more focused on, on that. Our ministry, we were in Azerbaijan from 1996 to 2000. We lived in the second largest city in, the city, uh, second largest city in Azerbaijan. We started a microcredit program. Are you familiar with that term? Microfinance, microcredit. Yeah, I'll tell you more about that later on. We had a culture program, and uh, we worked on building relationships. And uh, then we were there to plant a church. And uh, we decided very early on through our organization that we we would be quite high profile with what we did in Azerbaijan. And uh, yeah. That worked out quite well. Uh, yeah, I'll share more about that later. So microfinance or microcredit, what is that? It's giving loans to poor people so they can start or expand their businesses. Uh, we founded this operation in 1999 through, it was kind of partly private funding, but also governmental funding from Norway. 80% came from governmental funds in Norway and 20% from private donations. Uh, this operation, or uh, the microfinance fund, was profitable already after one year because you charge interest on the, on the loans you give to the poor people. And uh, what do you think, if you want to help poor people, should you charge a high interest? Or is that a good way of helping? No. Not very high. Do you know what we charge in Azerbaijan? I mean, this is, this is a development uh, project, and uh, we charged people, uh, the customers, we charged like 36% mm, interest wow. annually. A bunch of crooks. Yeah. <laughs> it's not so very what, what, what do you think? Is that a good way of helping? <laughs> no. Uh, no. Why not? Well, it would too high. Too high? Well, yeah. If, yeah. if, if it were, there were small enough loans, yeah. and the business was profitable enough, it would generate more to be able to help more people too. Yeah. So you could see it yeah. both ways. Yeah, this is why it was profitable, pro profitable so early, of course, that we had this huge interest rate. Yeah. And, uh, well, I can tell you that we had 
the way we worked was that first people had to come to a, 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 an information meeting, and there we informed everyone about kind of <coughs> deal how we worked, and uh, and we also said that you need to have a, uh, in the beginning they had to have a, a business already, so they could use the loan to expand their businesses, and then we said the interest rate is three percent per month, and people started laughing because they thought it was so cheap. Because the alternative for these people was to borrow money in the black market where they had to pay 20 to 25% interest. And here, per, per month, month. month, per month, really? per month. What is and we charged you? only 3%. So per what month. was your cost for, for that money? Our cost was, in the beginning, nothing. Because it was a grant from the Norwegian government. Yeah. So, not hard to make a profit. No. <laughs> Very easy. <laughs> but of course, we hired people, so we had some expense, expenses there. We had to we had an office, we rented an office, and things like that. We bought some cars, so there were some expenses, but not very hard to make a profit. Uh, in 2002, like three years uh, after we started the program, uh, there uh, uh, was an external ev evaluation of everything. And uh, the report concluded that through this project alone, 1,000 new workplaces had been created in Janja. What sort of businesses did they start? They started, it was farming, it was production, it was trade, any kind of business actually. Mm. So 1,000 new workplaces in a city of 200,000 people. What do you think about that? Mm. Wow. I still cannot understand this number because it's so high. <laughs> you know, it's, it's right. Is, is this really possible? But what about default? Yeah, we had we had uh, ninety five percent payback on time, wow. and ninety nine percent total. So it's it's better wow. than most banks actually. In, uh, <laughs> That's for sure. In the Western world. Maybe you could go and run the U.S. government for a while. Yeah. 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 I'm sorry. <laughs> that was for Dave's benefit, but he didn't hear it. So. But then already after three years, you can see the project impacting the whole city in some sense, because yeah. so many new workplaces were created. And uh, I have to tell you that, because the first loan in a, in, a, in a project like this, the first loan that people can get is usually like between 50 and uh, 500 US dollars. It's not very much. So, uh, what can you do with $50 or $100 or $200? Uh, not very much. And when we informed uh, the city government or, uh, of our plans, and we talked with the mayor in, uh, in uh, Ganja, uh, he just said, that we don't need a big project like this, because we need someone starting big businesses, not kind of someone giving loans of 50 100, 200 US dollars. So he said, we don't need it, but we will allow you to start anyway. After a while, of course, he saw the value of the project. So he, I think he was quite surprised that it, this worked so well. And, uh, today, the project has itself approximately 50 employees. It has branches in three cities, so, so it, it works more and more like an old bank. And it has more than 12,000 customers and uh, it has it, two years ago it was rated among the top micro credit funds in the world is that amazing <laughs> <laughs> yes yeah so uh, it has great impact now, here are some common customers who will be as an Azerbaijani name milk production we had customers quite many customers borrowing money to buy a cow and uh, a cow in Azerbaijan at that time, the cost of a cow was around 400 US dollars. Wow. And uh, then just by selling the milk, they were able to pay back the loan in six to seven months. Mm -hmm. And then after they paid back the first loan, they could get the second loan, which was twice as big as the first one. So after half a year, then they could buy two cows, and then they had three, and one was paid back already. And then by selling the milk of the two others, they could pay back the loan again in six, seven months. So after it, one year, they owned uh, three cows, and all of them were paid back. So that was a very good help for 
for four families. Then I'll deal here with the bakery, buying uh, flour, buying equipment, and uh, Elgar, Elgar doing trade. We have uh, many people uh, borrowing money to go to, uh, to Russia to buy products and bring back products to Azerbaijan to sell there. Doing, and also people doing trade both ways. So, uh, was the bread as good as it looks to eat? It was very good. Yeah. Yeah. And we, there were many, many small bakeries around. So I would, my job in the morning was always to go to all the local bakery. And it was fresh bread just from the, the yeah. oven. So I had to carry it like this, you know, with it on my sleeves because it was all hot. Wow. <laughs> Going back to my family, you know, with this good smell. Nice. Everyone was happy there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's a nice part of the culture. Okay, do you have any questions regarding microfinance? Yeah. Um, when you had that meeting and they laughed at your three and a half percent, yeah. how did that process, I mean, how did you go switch to 36 percent after you told them that it's 36 It is 36. And it's oh, per month. Oh, okay, yeah. okay. Yeah, I, I didn't understand. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's actually more than 36 percent. And yeah. Three percent per month. Um, yeah. It's more if you add. Yeah. yeah. And uh, what's the interest rate today? Today it's down to two percent per month. Yeah, it's it's still okay. a lot. Yeah, it's still a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Are you leveraging any investors? Are you, yeah. are you leveraging? Like, how can people invest? Yeah, it's possible to invest, but uh, the way they do it now, because when uh, when uh, you succeed with funds funds like this, uh, there will always be a demand for more money, mm -hmm. and uh, so the loan capital has to grow. And I know they started loaning, kind of borrowing money, uh, more like a normal bank. You borrow money and then you give loans. Right. So that's the way it works now. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm not sure if they take private investments. Uh, Have you heard of Tivo? Tivo, no. It's, it's just, I think it's an American actually. This young gal in her early 20s, she started a similar venture and, yeah. and used the internet yeah. to raise capital to underwrite these. Micro businesses and it's been amazing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. We've also started in Norway now. Uh, I was one of the founders there, uh, resource, no, not a resource center, but more like a resource center for microfinance. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that center again is starting a new fund now in Burundi, in Africa, in this fall. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, I think it's a, it's, it's a very good way of helping poor people. And, and the good thing is that everyone keeps their uh, kind of. Uh, it's not. It's, it's not like there is one helper and one being helped. It's like you, you meet on an equal basis because you're a customer and 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 we're the ones providing a loan. And if you don't pay back, we we actually we treat you like a normal customer. You will be in big trouble. <laughs> so we told people at the information meetings as well. We said that well, you know, we will we will do anything. Uh, to get his money back, and uh, the only thing we will not do is we will not kill you. But uh, <laughs> with that exception, we will do anything to get the money back. And, and uh, you know, when you start a new thing, people try to cheat you, especially in a corrupt nation like this. So it was very, very much hard work to get kind of good routines on how to get your money back. Yeah. Now, with this, I don't see any uh, like. Uh where did ministry come into this? Ministry come into this? Yes. Yeah, I think I think it is a ministry to, to, to help poor people to get out of, out of poverty. That's a ministry in itself. And then uh, later on I'll talk about how this opened the doors for the gospel as well. Okay. Yeah. Then we had a culture program. Uh, and we had cultural exchange between uh, Norway and Azerbaijan. Uh, so we had these paintings. They were Famous or famous, they were not that famous, but very good painters in Azerbaijan. Uh, so we brought their paintings to Norway for sale there, and then we brought Norwegian paintings to Azerbaijan. We also had uh, music exchange, and uh, one project we started very, very early was that we made a CD of uh, Azerbaijani and Norwegian music combined. And uh, uh, what, what what do you think that will 
sound like. <laughs> you want to listen to it? Yeah. Here we go. It should be here. That's not it. Yeah, that's not it. This is a Norwegian choir singing. And then we have Azerbaijani artists, actually, the Azerbaijani musicians and the Azerbaijani artists starting to sing. And Siarush, he was also one of the most famous musicians in Azerbaijan at this time. Mm -hmm. So it was like the wow. top people, not Christian singers, but the top people in the Azerbaijan. <coughs> so it was very high profile. And then this is the CD when it was released. And the title is actually The Land That We Came From. The Land That We Came From. Mm -hmm. It has a double meaning because a Norwegian archaeologist he came to Azerbaijan to look for the roots of the Norwegian people because in our king's history it says that the origin of the Norwegian people is east of the Black Sea and then you, you're in the area of Azerbaijan. So he came there and he, he shared these views with the Azerbaijani TV and uh, it was very well received down there. So for us it's the land we came from could be Azerbaijan. But then for the Azerbaijanis it's it's pointing towards this picture here, which is a church. It's a very, very old church that is in a small village called Kish. And according to the tra tradition in that village, this church was built by Jacob, the brother of Jesus. No, by a disciple of Jacob, the brother of Jesus. And it, it was built already in the year 80 after Christ. That's the local tradition. So we brought archaeologists up here asking them, could it be true that this church is that old? <laughs> and they said, well, parts of this church is probably from the 3rd century. That's what they found out. And then our organization decided that we should try to make this into a museum, pointing back to the Christian era of Azerbaijan, because Azerbaijan was actually a Christian nation from 300 to 700 before the Muslims came. So we wanted to point back to the Christian roots of the Azerbaijani people, mm -hmm. so the land we came from, the Christian roots. Unfortunately, we have to say, when they started digging here and making this into a museum, they found out that this had been a worship place even before the Christian era. And then the, the Azerbaijani people, they were fire worshippers. So now, <laughs> it's not the land we came from is not pointing back only to the Christian era, but even before that, in the museum, okay. to the fire worshipping era. But that's okay. I mean. For us it was important to, to show to people that Christianity and the Gospel of Jesus is some, not something that you're receiving from the West. It is something that was yours before it came to us. And now we're just bringing it back to you. We thought that would open the way for it. Open the doors for the Gospel. So making the city. Uh, and uh, because of the city, uh, that's the only time I've been interviewed on CNN. 
Did you watch that program? Like, uh, it was in 1997. Don't tell us. You've got a clip of it. <laughs> no, I haven't. Uh, you wish. I uh, should have. Yeah. <laughs> then we had uh, concerts every month in Ganja with Ganja State Chamber Orchestra, which was a, an orchestra of professional musicians. And we sponsored this concert, one monthly concert, and uh, brought uh, 200, 250 people together for the concerts. It was all for free for uh, everyone, everyone coming there. Funny thing is, because Azerbaijan being a Christian nation, you found many churches around, like in the cities as well. And uh, this chamber orchestra, they had their rehearsals and the concerts in an old Albanian church. And uh, Albania, why is it named Albanian church? Because uh, the Romans, this is history, but the Romans called this country for Caucasus Albania. That's why the church in Azerbaijan is called the Albanian, or the old church was called the Albanian church. So they had the rehearsals and the concerts in the Albanian church in Ganja. So we brought actually many, many people together in the church to have these concerts. <laughs> And because we were the main sponsors of, of this uh, chamber orchestra, I was allowed to have an opening speech at each concert. Mm -hmm. And uh, at this time, uh, just after we came to Azerbaijan, uh, a new law was implied prohibiting foreigners for, from uh, sharing, like promoting religion uh, and, uh, in, in public. So I thought, well, and we prayed many times, well, what can I say? <laughs> we don't want to break the law. And uh, still, so I'm going to speak in public here, and I want to share about Christ, and I want to share about God. So uh, what we decided is that, you know, we, we had Christmas concerts, we had Easter concerts, because this was in the church. <laughs> and then uh, when people came together, I, I just, instead of sharing the gospel, I just told them about the history of the building. It was like, you know, this is Easter or this is Christmas and we're here together to celebrate uh, or to have a Christmas concert. And at this time of the year in history, in this building, since this is a church, they were gathering to celebrate the birth of Jesus. And <laughs> then I could share about Jesus coming to, to the world. And then at Easter, of course, this is what they preached in this church <laughs> at Easter time. <laughs> and I had to share, share the gospel with people. <coughs> We always had people from the local authorities, representatives, coming to the concerts, and they sat always in front there. And I was speaking, and and uh, they never said anything. Like uh, it didn't cause any problems. Although we shared uh, the gospel at these these events. Then we saw the ancient church in Kish, as you can see on the photo there. Then the church planting work. Uh, let me ask you. Uh, First here, do you think it's a good idea for a mission agency to be a main sponsor of a, cham of a chamber orchestra? Do you think that's a good idea? Is that wise use of money? Yeah? yeah? <laughs> it gave us the opportunity to share the gospel. Uh, our reasoning there was that this was a very difficult time in the Azerbaijani history because uh, they got their freedom, but their economy had broken down. So people didn't have very much, and we thought of that, what, what does God want us to do in this situation? And we know that God, He, is, he loves beauty. And uh, for many people, uh, like chamber orchestra music, that's beautiful music. So we thought, well, God, in this situation, in this difficult situation, He wants there to be some beauty. So we, we can make that happen. <laughs> And then uh, we also thought, well, God wants to give hope back to people. And if they can see that their own cultural life is still alive, mm -hmm. then maybe that can bring hope back to the people here. So that was the reasoning behind us becoming the main sponsors of the Chamber Orchestra. Then we had a church planting. We saw approximately 60 people being baptized while we were there uh, within these four years. Do you think that's much or little? Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's quite, quite a good number. Yeah. And uh, it, it was just amazing. It felt like every Sunday there were someone standing up saying, I want to follow Jesus. 
when we invited people to to receive him. Uh, we decided to have a local leadership very early on, and uh, the man you see here, uh, he functioned as the local pastor. Uh, so we asked him to move to Ganja. We met him in Baku, where he was a part of a congregation. We asked him to move to Ganja and to join our work there. And he, of course, he had the keys on how to communicate with people. Uh, then we formed uh, house groups. Uh, first, we had uh, like the meetings in our home because we had a big home. So we had up to 70 people gathering in our, home, in our house. But then people got a bit scared because uh, the police were ra raiding some uh, uh, congregations in the capital. So we decided to break the, the, the big group down into four smaller groups and the gathering in local homes instead. I was, I was responsible for the training of young leaders and uh, uh, tried to kind of train them to be future leaders in the church. And that was quite hard work, I thought. <laughs> it was not easy. The key to this church growth, or these 60 people being baptized, I think we found the key. Uh, the last year we were in Azerbaijan, we met or we visited an old Baptist congregation with uh, I think the average age in that congregation must have been more than 18 years. So it was only old Russian ladies, or old Azerbaijani ladies speaking Russian. They came together on the Sundays. This had been an underground church for many, many, many years. And uh, so the leader in that congregation, she said, it's amazing what's happening now. Uh, we've been praying for this city every day for 50 years that people will, will meet Jesus and now we see that it's happening so 50 years every day have you prayed for anything 50 years every day? <laughs> no <laughs> neither have, have I and uh, it's just amazing to see people being that faithful they have a vision that finally something will happen here yeah. and they continue to pray until it happens so I think we could actually uh, harvest but we had not sown, and uh, other people had done the groundwork before, before we came there. And uh, yeah, it, it, from time to time you feel like you're just watching what God is doing. It's like if this is not a part of yourself. And I have, I have that feeling, although we came there to plant a church, and we saw this uh, church kind of being founded and uh, starting to work, and, and then like this, it's like I'm not a part of this, it's like I'm an outsider, it's so clear that God is doing everything here and he's the one leading people to himself and uh, I would not take credit for any one of these 60 people here being baptized because it was the young Azerbaijanis receiving Christ, they were so eager to share the gospel with their friends and their families so it was them actually bringing New people into the church. So here is a picture from our living room uh, when we have the young people coming together. This is actually at Christmas time. So the young people they had a Christmas play, and uh, you can see we had quite many, many, many people there. And uh, it's a bit sad for me to see this picture because uh, this guy here, he's he's really he's a very gifted evangelist. Will be is his name. Very gifted evangelist, and he has he has such a powerful uh, encounter with Jesus when he gave his life to Jesus. So he started bringing people to the church, and after a while, I, and I think it was our mistake. We gave him too much responsibility too early, so he became proud. Uh, and uh, after a while, it was just like when we had leadership meetings. It was like if we contradicted him or his thoughts, he said, well, you're not actually contradicting me. This is uh, what Jesus uh, has shown, us, shown me that we should do. So you are, you are speaking against Jesus. <laughs> of course, that's very difficult when people start talking like that. So in the end, he took a, a big part of the young people with him and he started a church on his own. And I knew from the very beginning that this is not going to last. And, uh, 
we were then just about going back to Norway. So I had to follow the, the development from Norway. And after three, four, five months, everything uh, fell apart. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've been in touch with him like half a year ago. And uh, he says he still has his pay. But uh, he was caught actually stealing some money uh, one year after this happened. So he ended up in a very, very difficult situation. And he's not a part of any prison work today. This guy here, Rav Shan, he was also one future leader. I, I believe that he could be a, <laughs> a good leader in the future. And, uh, and his family was very, very strongly attacked. Uh, both him and his sister, they came to the Lord. But then uh, he had two sisters. So him and one of his sisters came to the Lord. The other sister was going to have a baby. She was married. And because this was a poor family, she decided to have the baby at home. And uh, then she had to do the cesarean. Is that what you call it? Cesarean. And uh, you know, to do that at home, if that's not very good. So she, she got an infection later on and uh, ended up in hospital where she died mm -hmm. because of this. And uh, we prayed for her, you know, we prayed and prayed and prayed that she would survive and God would, would heal her. But it didn't happen. And you think that, well, maybe they will lose their faith because of this, but the good thing is that God can even turn situations like that into something good. So now the whole family is saved, both the mother and the father and uh, him and, and his sister. That, that's, that's wonderful. That's, you think that, well, if they do not experience that it actually helps to pray, maybe they will lose the faith. Mm -hmm. But still, they kept the faith and it was even strengthened by what happened. We had another guy as well, another leader here. Uh, he was a really passionate guy. And he was in a car accident. He was ran over by a car and also died. So we experienced so many deaths like, and difficult things there in the beginning. And uh, I think it was, it couldn't be just by accident. It, it, it was like very clear that this is uh, God's enemy trying to stop <coughs> the work that going on. So some learning points from the aura working in Azerbaijan. <coughs> hospitality, we've talked about hospitality here earlier in this course. That was, I can tell you, a constant challenge for my wife and I. I regard myself as, as a very hospitable person and, and my wife and I, we love when people just knock on our door and they come to visit us. But uh, in Azerbaijan it was a struggle uh, because people came more often than we we uh, would like to receive them, <laughs> and uh, what do you do then? We find it extremely difficult to find, find time to, to take time off, just to relax. And uh, I could say to my kids, well, you know, tonight we can play together because I don't have any work to do, and uh, we can play. And then suddenly you have someone knocking at the door. And as the father in the house, according to the local culture, I had to sit down and talk with these people. So I couldn't play with my kids anyway. And when you have this happening regularly, it is very, very difficult in the family situation. So how can you deal with that? Here, it, uh, here is our solution. Every Saturday, we took our car and we drove away from our home and from our city <coughs> to another city, just to be together as a family. Because we knew that if someone is knocking at your door, we have to let them in. That's the local culture. You cannot say, well, you know, you cannot come now. We have other things to do. But if you go away, you don't have any responsibility <laughs> if you're in another city. You don't know anyone, and you can be there as a family. So that was a relief, kind of our way of getting time off and family time, was to take the car and drive away. And others, when they heard, heard this, they said, well, it sounded maybe a bit racist because we said we, we always go on our own. We don't bring any other pajamas with us <laughs> because we needed family time. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that was kind of a good thing for us to organize the life that way. We had to organize uh, kind of something to get time off. 
But then, you know, people interact with you in ways you don't want to. And, and uh, when you're in a hospitable culture, people want to help, them, help you more than you actually need help. So I remember my wife and I, uh, it's the only time this has happened in our 17 years of marriage. We were uh, actually vomiting at the same time. Uh, we had been eating at a restaurant and uh, the food was probably not good. And then we had been at the concert with the chamber orchestra and uh, we came home and my wife says, that I'm, I feel so tired, I feel, I'm so tired that I'm sick. I think I, I need to go to the bathroom and just throw up. <laughs> and I thought, well, that's strange, isn't it? That you're so tired, you need to throw up. But I heard her going and she started to vomit and uh, then I, I wanted to go to sleep. But then I felt, well, I don't feel good either. <laughs> So I also had to go to the bathroom and I started throwing up as well. So she was standing in one side of the bathroom, I, I was standing in the other side. Both of us throwing up at the same time, the same time. And then what happens? Well, there was a window leading next to the yard of the neighbor. So as we're throwing up, the neighbor is knocking at the window. And he says, Gonshu is neighbor. Uh, do you have any problems? And we say, no, <laughs> no, we're OK. <laughs> And he said, well, I can hear you have some problems. Uh, we will come over to help you. <laughs> oh, no, thank you. Oh, yes, we will come. And then two minutes later, they're knocking at the door, at the gate. And I go to open, and it's like, uh, it's, a, it's a very difficult situation, but I know I have to let them in because they've come to help us. And then, you know, they have this milk with clumps, and it's like, oh, sour milk. And he says, yeah, if you drink this, you will be better. And I thought, well, I cannot argue with him here. It's like, uh, I feel so weak. So I just took the, this glass of milk and I drank it. And I said, well, you know, I feel much better now. No, I think you can leave. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> and then, uh, uh, as soon as they uh, were gone, we took uh, like two buckets and we moved to the other uh, end of the house and we continued to throw <laughs> another half hour, you know, in silence. <laughs> yeah, and I was so, you know, because of this hospitality, people coming, uh, what, we, did, we did one big mistake and that's that people in Azerbaijan also, they sleep in the middle of the day uh, and all, they also let their kids sleep in the middle of the day. Whereas in Norway, in our culture, we have what we call adult time in the evening. We put the kids to bed and then we have time as adults just to talk. And we like that, you know, and it's like, okay, the kids are in bed, we can now be just you and I and we can talk. <laughs> so we decided that we will not let our kids sleep in the middle of the day and we did also not sleep ourselves. And then you have guests coming over late at night and you find yourself actually being very, very tired receiving your guests and, and they stay as long as they want, of course. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I've, one time I've, I fell asleep talking to a friend. You know, I, I couldn't stay awake. So while he was talking to me, I fell asleep. Another time I tried to stay awake and uh, I, I realized, well, you know, I'm too tired to talk. So I let him talk. <laughs> I, just, I just need to keep my eyes open here and, and try to follow what he's saying. And then uh, in the end, I, I thought, well, I need some fresh air uh, to stay awake here. So I said, well, just a minute, I have to go outside a little bit. And I went out and took a deep breath, uh, being ready to go in again. And then on the way in, I, I just dropped by the kitchen and I leaned towards the wall <laughs> just for like, to relax a little bit. Give me just 10 seconds break here. Next thing, I find myself like on the way to the floor, sleeping. <laughs> wow. So you're so extremely tired, you know. And then you have guests in your living room. You don't know what to do, what can you do? <laughs> it's really insane. So be prepared for uh, being more hospitable than you would like. And uh, for this being a challenge. You were never you. insane. Okay, then uh, uh, also. What was difficult for us was that we had more than one culture to relate to. We were prepared for meeting the Azerbaijani culture and, uh, and we made good friends with the Azerbaijanis. But we had huge struggles with our Norwegian teammates and their culture and uh, how they adapted to the local culture. So that was very, very, very tough. And also then you have 
other expatriates living in the same city and also to kind of relate to their culture, that's uh, not easy. And then you have the Christian culture, which also causes tensions. And uh, I told you earlier today what we did with alcohol. We decided to dr eat and drink what they gave to us. And, uh, and if you decide to do that, you have to kind of stick with what you're doing uh, throughout the time you're there. So if you've started to kind of say cheers with people and uh, drink this vodka. Actually, I, I emptied a little glass of vodka in, a, in an evening, whereas the Azerbaijanis, they emptied the glass every time they said cheers, you know. So it's kind of, they always ask me, why do you not drink alcohol? Although I thought I drank a lot because I drank this little glass of vodka. Uh, but then, uh, you know, when you, you start, we started out like that. After a while, we brought... Uh, Christian Azerbaijanis with us to to the same places and to the same families, and uh, some of them came from a Baptist background where uh, the greatest greatest sin you could commit was to drink alcohol. Yeah. And uh, then I felt really caught, like in between two cultures, because I I was not there to promote absence from alcohol. I was there to present the gospel to people. Then we brought the young, I found myself once, and we had brought some young Azerbaijani believers with us to a family. And uh, this family gave us wine and vodka as they use, uh, usually did. And these young Christians, they saw me drink the alcohol. And I knew that for them this is committing a great sin. <laughs> so I found myself as a missionary and, you know, I, I was, I was uh, not drinking alcohol at all in Norway before we went to Azerbaijan. So I started drinking when I was a missionary. And then, <laughs> then I find myself explaining to a local Azerbaijani believer that as Christians, you know, we have the freedom to drink alcohol. Imagine <laughs> what you feel it's like. <laughs> so you cross like uh, in between so many kind of things you need to think about and uh, many, many cultures. So what, what is the right thing to do? It's not easy, is it? Do you have any input here? From <laughs> when it comes to alcohol, we had a we had a Southern Baptist missionary, uh, very nice guy. He was living in Azerbaijan, and we brought him with us to to a village called Nietzsche, where we had some work. And in Nietzsche, it was only two things to to, to drink: it, it was the local wine and the local vodka. And uh, and since we were guests, they always gave us the best they had. But because of his background, he could not drink alcohol. So what he did, when we sat down around the table to eat this very wonderful food they had prepared and they would given us the best drinks they had, he said, I cannot drink this. And then he had his own box of Fanta that he took from his pocket and brought to the table. So he was drinking this Fanta that he has brought with him. What do you think about that? Is that a good solution? I don't want to pick on Southern Baptists, it's like they have tremendous, wonderful work. But uh, <laughs> it was very offensive. It was very offensive. And I, I could see and feel the hurt in these uh, hosts. It, it was really an awful situation. And, and I, I felt like he'd been there longer than I had, and uh, I could not start explaining it. He was also much older than me, so I couldn't explain it to him. But uh, I think that was totally wrong. I mean, he could, he could have asked for something else to drink, but not bring your own American drink. <laughs> yeah. It's like, I need something from my home country. <laughs> yeah. it's not, these are not easy questions. Church planting, what we learned was that we could do microfinance, microcredit for the Lord. You asked about this. Uh, you know, in, in the microfinance uh, fund, we had people, because this was a corrupt nation, I even had, as a foreigner, people coming to my office saying that, you know, if you can make sure that I receive a loan of 500 US dollars, the day I receive the loan, I will put 100 dollars in your pocket. <laughs> That's a good deal, isn't it? <laughs> and uh, I said, well, I cannot do that. And they said, why not? No one will know about, about it. And uh, I said, well, I have to stand in front of a holy God with my life. And he knows. And of course, they are Muslims. They know also. And they said, yes, you're right. <laughs> so we got this reputation that uh, they knew we were Christians and that in this uh, work, you cannot cheat. And you cannot pay bribes. You cannot pay money under the table. 
that treats everyone equally. So I think that was very important, actually, for them, as a pre-evangelistic work. Uh, also, we had people from the local bank coming to our bank to get a loan. <laughs> and we said, why? Why do you come here? <laughs> and they said, you know, in our bank, if you receive a loan of 1,000 US dollars, or it's written 1,000 dollars in the contract, we only receive 800, and 200 is lost in the way. Whereas here, we receive the full amount, so it's a better deal. Did that cause any problems with the local like, bank owners? No, no. They knew they were doing something, something wrong, you know. It's, uh, so we, we, were, we were known as people doing things the right way, mm -hmm. and uh, we were Christians. I think that was a good testimony for people. So my group had it. Also, of course, we had customers, we could talk about faith with customers. So it opened the doors for us for sharing the gospel. Then we had a culture work, uh, doing the culture work for the Lord. I told you that God wants beauty, and He wants to give the hope back to people. And also through the culture work, we could share about, uh, about Jesus and about God's kingdom. And uh, one thing we know sure, for sure is that in, in, in God's kingdom, there will be music. So just to share that, that, you know, we're here at the concert and uh, we will listen to beautiful music. And there is one thing you know for sure, this is created by God and it will also be music in eternity. <laughs> and God is restoring everything. That is also giving hope back to people. And then we did church planting for the Lord. So what we saw very clearly was that everything worked together for one uh, purpose. Yes. That's uh, our story. I have to tell you, like Ari said with his story, that I didn't share this story here until I had to do it. I was forced to do it in, here in Victoria five years ago. And uh, it felt like complete failures when we came back from Azerbaijan. It was like, uh, yeah, in the end, because we had these team problems and uh, struggles in the organization, we felt that the organization was actually very happy when we decided to quit. And uh, it's like uh, we felt that the work was not kind of finished. We wanted, we wanted to continue to be there. We had uh, strong relationships that we had to break. And uh, it was just like, we felt like complete failures. So I, I didn't want to share this story with anyone. I said, there is no story. <laughs> And, uh, and then Ari said, oh, I think you should share your story. And it was amazing that the first time I shared it here, uh, I had some people coming to me afterwards saying, well, this was actually a good testimony. And we can see that God was working through you. Mm -hmm. I said, well, is, is that possible? And, uh, and then when you retell the story, and now I can realize that actually God was doing something. But uh, the feelings mm -hmm. we had at that time was all bad. And now we see we see the same in so many tent makers because we interact with tent makers, and we see that even the tent makers that God is using in the most amazing way, they have this feeling that well, they, I'm I'm a failure. I'm not doing what I should. Is, is that protection against them becoming too proud? It could be. Yeah, it could be. And it's also very difficult. I, it depends on your personality. Like my personality is that I tend to focus on unsolved things. So uh, it's I, kind of I don't have time to look back and see that things have happened here, <laughs> and uh, and then if you always focus on the challenges, then you don't see the big picture. You just miss it, and you need to tell the story to other people and, and get feedback, yeah. and then you, then you can see what is happening. And I think that's that's a big part of what we're doing is actually to to listen to stories and give feedback. Uh, to encourage people, because we can see from the outside that God is doing great things through people. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Thank you for listening. And, uh, yeah. yeah.